Сейчас я хочу представить нашего гостя из университета Алабамы, доктора Ричарда Кугера. I would like to thank academician uh, Alexei Rosanov and Professor Spivina and Professor Yevkina for this kind invitation for me to come and join your most interesting conference. <clears throat> the, the fundamental question of astrobiology is, is life restricted to the planet Earth or more widely distributed across the cosmos? And there have been a number of recent discoveries that have been validated a number of long-held paradigms about the origin, distribution, and evolution of life on Earth and provided new perspectives in astrobiology. Recent space missions have shown that water and biogenic elements and energy and organics are widely distributed throughout the universe, and there have been advancements in uh, technology that have made it possible to obtain better and more precise information about carbonaceous meteorites. All life requires the coexistence of water, can be in either liquid, solid, or gaseous form, a source of energy, a small suite of biogenic elements, of which the major ones are carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, phosphorus, and sulfur. Those are needed for energy, metabolism, reproduction, and construction of life-critical biomolecules. And the important point is that all of those uh, bio biogenic elements and sources uh, are present uh, throughout the cosmos. <laughs> Water is the second most abundant molecule in the universe, and it comprises 60 to 70 percent of the cells. And the Reynolds number in, for bacterium in water is of the order of 10 to the minus 5, which means that the coasting distance is about 0 0.1 angstroms, and the detection of locomotion, true motility, provides definitive evidence of life. Water has this uh, hydrogen oxygen hydrogen bond angle of about 104.5 degrees, and that provides a water molecule with polarity, giving high surface tension and high boiling point. The maximum density of fresh water is at plus 3.8 Celsius and ocean water about minus 2 to minus 4. That's a very, very important point. That means that since water has that maximum density and it sinks, the seafloor of all deep bodies of water anywhere in the universe will be essentially identical. They will be a temperature very near 0 Celsius. They could be fresh or they could be salty. They may have a slightly high pH, slightly low pH but it doesn't matter. There are microorganisms that can live in those conditions, that love to live in those conditions, and that means that the deep oceans of all planets and moons are alike, and therefore terrestrial biology would have no problem whatsoever inhabiting those environments. <clears throat> Water is uh, absolutely essential to the structure, dynamics, stability, and function of biological mac macromolecules. It mediates the uh, chain collapse and protein folding and interaction between binding partners to search for native topology by a funnel, funnel energy landscape. It actively participates in the recognition of, of molecules and interactions between binding partners and contributes to enthalpic and entropic stabilization. It's not just an inert environment, but it's an integral and active component of biomolecular systems with both dynamic and structural roles. The point is, water has been found on all planets in our solar system and on moons, uh, on comets, uh, it is uh, the dominant volatile. volatile. It's also been found on water-bearing asteroids. And I'll just show a few of, a few of those. Uh, cold regions, uh, we know that microorganisms love to live in permafrost and polar ice caps and hot uh, areas and geysers, fumaroles, uh, hydrothermal vents, hot crustal rocks, hypersaline, hyperacidic, hy hyperalkaline pools, high radiation environments, high pressure environments, and in hard vacuum as you find on the outside of Mir and the International Space Station. Biomolecules, uh, there are a whole host of biomolecules uh, which are very important. The very large biomolecules cannot be produced by any known abiotic mechanisms and therefore the detection of these large biomolecules or the detection of homochorality would provide absolutely undeniable proof of the evidence of life. Biosignatures in atmospheres can be used, for example, one of the most important ones is looking for molecular oxygen, which is very reactive and released by photosynthesis. It can remain in long, for long periods in equilibrium in planetary atmospheres, and uh, molecular oxygen on Earth is produced by biology. 
Several of the very interesting, recent, exciting developments. Mercury discovered water ice near the polar caps of, of uh, uh, the messenger spacecraft de detected water ice near the polar caps of Mercury. And of course, water and acids are found in the upper atmospheres of Venus. We've known for a long time that there was water uh, and ice and snow uh, on the surface of, of uh, Mars. This is a picture taken in 1979, May 18th, and it shows snow on the surface of, of Mars at the Viking II lander site. That picture was photographed in 1979. NASA released it in 1997. Here's the polar cap of Mars, 95% uh, pure water ice in Planum Boreum. And just recently, NASA announced that this uh, recurring slope lineae, which was actually imaged in 2011, provided evidence of present-day liquid water on Mars. Well, years ago, I went with David Gilchinsky to the Kolomo lowlands of North Siberia, and as we were flying back, I got this beautiful photograph of pattern ground, and you see these double rim polygons. We obtained images uh, of double rim polygons on Mars, and as you that know a great deal about permafrost, know that this is associated with freezing and thawing of ice, and once you thaw the ice, you have liquid water. So that provided evidence of liquid water on Mars, and that image was obtained back in 1999. We also know that there's liquid water oceans and the uh, geysers uh, on, uh, at the south pole of Europa. Uh, and uh, <coughs> this, uh, this is images of uh, the Connemara Chaos region in, uh, on Europa, and here you have uh, uh, the various interesting colors, the white snow and the blue ice, and golden browns and oranges, the very deep reddish, or reddish colors and purples in the Minoas uh, Alenia region. Uh, this is the snow algae that I photographed in the Coloma lowlands. I went to the snow bank every, uh, every day collecting snow algae. Uh, this is from the deep core in, in Greenland. And from the Fox Tunnel, we described this new species as Carnobacterium plasticinium. And here is uh, Dale Anderson doing a dive in the International uh, uh, Lake Untersea Astrobiology Expedition. And here you see cyanobacterial stromatolites, formidium, and a variety of other cyanobacteria growing at the bottom of Lake Untersea under 10 meters of ice and 90 meters of water. And those uh, cyanobacteria are red because they're growing in low light level conditions. Don produced evidence of liquid water on the asteroids uh, Ceres and Four Vesta. <coughs> and we also know, that, of course, that there is the water on Saturn's moon Enceladus, and it is causing these very exciting geysers. If you notice here, notice the flaring. This is the comet 9P Temple 1 out beyond the orbit of Mars. And at the area here, the temperature is 330 uh, Kelvin, 57 Celsius, so clearly even beyond the orbit of Mars, this comet has gotten hot enough that internal ices will be melted and turned into liquid water and then evaporated into gases that produce pressure on the crust, and occasionally a portion of the crust fails and blows out chunks of ice and mineral grains and dust, and you get these kinds of flares. Recently, uh, Molecular oxygen was detected as the fourth dominant molecule surrounding the comet 67P Cherimov Gerasimenko. Molecular oxygen was not only detected, but color photographs showed dark blue green areas and pinks and reds, which could be consistent with microorganisms, primarily cyanobacteria type organisms, photosynthesizers, growing on and near the surface of comet 67P. Sabita Buizov, who pioneered the study of microorganisms in the deep ice at Lake Vostok, came and, and visited me on a few occasions. This is an image of a diatom from 2,827 meters in the Vostok ice core, and here are most bacteria from the ice cap uh, in, uh, in Iceland. Water and organics have recently been found on, on Uranus and Neptune and, and uh, Neptune's moon Triton. 
and more recently on uh, the water ocean and organics on Pluto and Charon. Carbonaceous meteorites are primitive meteorites, only about, uh, eight, there are only eight known groups. Uh, the most exciting ones to me are the CI1s, uh, of which we have uh, only nine, and of those, uh, four were finds in, in Antarctica, all the others were observed falls. Uh, these carbonaceous meteorites contain 3 to 22 percent deuterium and rich water and 4 percent approximately of extraterrestrial carbon. They have extraterrestrial nucleobases bases and biomolecules. Uh, that was proven by the fact that the Del 13 C of Murchison Uracil was plus 44.5 per mil and xanthine plus 37.7 per mil. There's aqueous alteration of minerals and the deuterium hydrogen ratio proves that the, uh, there's, there was liquid water on the parent body of the carbonaceous CI, C1, and many other carbonaceous meteorites. The important point is that these meteorites contain breakdown products of chlorophylls. They contain pristane, phytane, and porphyrins. These are the C19, C20 diagenetic breakdown products. But chlorophylls, carotenoids, and phycobilin pigments of photosynthetic organisms have never been detected in the carbonaceous meteorites. Now, if these meteorites were contaminated by cyanobacteria, those pigments should be there. So, there is biomolecular evidence of in indigenous photosynthetic microorganisms on the parent body, but they were there long before the arrival of the, uh, the meteorites on Earth. The uh, amino acids and the meteorites were shown by Mike Engel many years ago to have a, a, a chirality, a... a an excess of the, uh, uh, of the L aminos, you can see here, uh, the, there is an excess of, of L glutamic acid in Murchison, that's in Parts Per Bay in Murchison, Murray, Orgay, and Ibuna. Uh, but the important point of this chart is that we notice here this whole range of amino acids that are missing from the carbonaceous meteorites. They're the same amino acids that are missing from hadrosaurs and Miocene flies in amber. Uh, these are the more unstable amino acids like methionine and phenylalanine and so forth. And so the presence of uh, a suite of amino acids and the absence of others is consistent with ancient biology, but it is not consistent with modern biological contaminants. If you contaminated this meteorite, any of these meteorites, with modern bacteria, you should have all 20 protein amino acids, all 23 proteinogenic amino acids present in the meteorites. At the NASA Marshall Space Flight Center, these are the groups of meteorites that were studied. Uh, many of them were done in collaboration with Alexei Rosanoff over a period of time when he came there, and then I would come to Russia, and we would have great enjoyment at the scanning electron microscope. We found uh, evidence of microfossils in all of them at Marshall, except these in red, and I have Allende listed in red. I never saw any evidence of microfossils in Allende, but yesterday Alexi showed some beautiful examples of microfossils in Allende. I just didn't study it as much, perhaps, as I should have, because I was interested in the ones that were more productive. Sony chondrites, the chondrites, iron meteorites have all been studied and have never shown any evidence of any microfossils of any kind. Contamination has always been a great worry, and so everything was done under very strict controls uh, and using a, a, a field emission scanning electron microscopy and, and energy dispersive X-ray spectrometry to differentiate between contaminants in the rare occasions when they were encountered and indigenous biological remains. In uh, uh, Academician Gallimov's book, Thermodynamic Fractionation of, of Biological Fractionation of Stable Isotopes, he showed this relative relationship of the fractionation uh, in these amino acids in the Murchison meteorite compared with Gracilaria, Chlorella, and Euglena. And he made the statement in his book, stable isotopes show carbon in meteorites as clearly extraterrestrial, but analogous to terrestrial biology. I commented to Academician Gallimov that I, was, I considered that to be the best evidence I had seen for biology in the meteorites outside of direct observations of microfossils. Um, 
The paradigm has been that all meteorites are contaminated. That paradigm is absolutely invalid. If these meteorites were contaminated, you should see the sugars, ribose, and deoxyribose, all of the uh, protein amino acids and cytosine and thymine are missing. Uh, they convert to your cytosine, goes to uracil with this half-life, and thymine to xanthine with a 1.3 million year half-life. The main area that I've been using to differentiate between uh, indigenous microfossils and living or dead organisms is two things, looking at beam damage. Here's, here's a Harmagonia of Lingbia. You see a little spot there where the ADS was taken, and it had 6.5% nitrogen, very recognizable nitrogen peak here. Ancient uh, biology can still contain nitrogen as long as it's not too ancient. This is a Pleistocene woolly mammoth guard hare, and it had 11.6% nitrogen. Hair typically is a protein, uh, uh, and, and it typically has content of nitrogen of the order of 15%. So this is perfectly within the right range. And this is not a recent modern woolly mammoth. Well, when we look, that was, that was a joke. <laughs> when we look at... Uh, at the nitrogen in the filaments, these are the Orgoia filaments, and I'm showing them at 0.5%. That means that they were simply not, nitrogen was simply not detected. Slight detection in a few of the filaments, but this is contaminated fungal filaments in Murchison, and these are living cyanobacteria, uh, ancient mummies and uh, woolly mammoths, and then trilobites and 2.7 billion year old cyanobacteria very much like what we find in the microfossils. The LA meteorite fell in uh, 1806, and uh, here is uh, a fossil for, uh, that Palik found in Orgay. Uh, these are uh, uh, from Migay, the Timofeyev material. This shows what happens when water is dropped on the Orgay meteorite, and it immediately starts to disintegrate. You can see bubbles forming, and the, 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 the stone just starts coming apart. This shows a microfossil in uh, uh, the Murchison meteorite. This is one that I showed to academicians of Arzine many years ago, and he pointed out that it was a Nostication cyanobacteria and identified the diverse components, the hollow sheet, cross-wall constrictions, and emergent harmagonia. And we look here, and you can see there is no nitrogen level visible there. Uh, right there is where the nitrogen should be. This shows the filament that Palik drew in 1962, and here you see a, a unisaria trichome in, in a sheath uh, of uh, form similar to formidium with a uh, calyptra. Here are cross-wall constrictions and an obvious harmagonium here. And this is consistent with the multiple trichomes within a common sheet, like the multisaria microcoleus thonoplastes. And here we see the form in visible light. It's quite a big fossil in carbon and oxygen, iron and nickel and silicon and sulfur. Uh, this shows a coil filament in the, in the Vostok. Uh, so this is the remains of a cyanobacterial filament, a similar coil filament here of oscillatory and cyanobacteria in the Orgaia meteorite. Heterocysts perform nitrogen fixation, and so those are found in, in a few types of heterocystis uh, cyanobacteria. They're not found in any of the uh, filamentous sulfur bacteria, so in this way we can clearly de determine that these images from the Orgaia meteorite are of cyanobacteria and not filamentous sulfur bacteria. Uh, here, we have embedded filaments here. Here's one right where you have a basal heterocyst. This is an enlargement of that area. And here's a calithrix, a very small species of calithrix from the Little White River of Oregon living in my laboratory. And it's about the same size and the same morphology as what we see in these filaments in the, uh, in the Orgaia meteorite. This shows uh, an, an intercalary heterocyst in uh, a nostoc type cyanobacteria in Orgaia, and here is an apical heterocyst in form similar to Slendrosperma. This shows an interesting array of cyanobacteria in Orgaia and a form uh, similar to Leosphoridia here, uh, very clearly 
delineated, and uh, and here we see in this uh, fossil right at the edge, uh, the nitrogen content is zero. We have no detectable nitrogen. There should be a nitrogen peak there if there are any nitrogen, but there is none. Rosemary Ripka pointed out that these were Lophophricus tufts of fibrii, which are almost never seen in this condition because they stick to the polysaccharide. Here you see them at 80,000 X. These tiny, this is a 200 nanometer bar. These very, very tiny structures are standing up and perfectly preserved. This is a beautiful filament uh, uh, in, uh, in the Argaia meteorite, and here we have a spectrum taken here, and, and you can see that there is a, a high magnesium and, and uh, sulfur and oxygen, uh, and here is the spectrum taken at this point, and the uh, carbon content is about 80%. Um, Alexi showed this beautiful form this morning or yesterday. This is in the Euphremica CB 3.5 carbonaceous meteorite. Possibly uh, something similar to a sarcodina. That's my tentative thinking about it. I haven't had a chance to talk with it about Alexi. He may have a much better identification of what this beast could be. But whatever it is, I think it is absolutely clear this is not a, a, a prokaryote. This is some kind of a eukaryote. In 2012, the uh, Polonarua stones fell in, in Sri Lanka, and they are highly porous. They have uh, uh, a very interesting array of minerals, uh, phaolite, olivines, quartz, zircon, and cristobalite, many other minerals, and high pressure minerals like wasleyite, um, which, which require extraterrestrial shock pressures of the order of 20 gigapascals. Uh, they contain Rare earth elements, uh, one to seven part per million irid iridium, and a variety of other rare earth elements. Shock grains, such as we see here in the ilmenite, and in the quartz grains, and the mascalonite. Uh, here we show how the, uh, the thorium samarium ratio in the Polonarua stones fall in this line, and so they're not dramatically different from the, uh, the basalts of the lunar mare. Uh, here's the CI1 thorium samarium ratios, and here is the Polonarua stones uh, in the AL203 thorium ratios. We see also this Euro europium uh, uh, dip. Uh, here it is in the Apollo 14 Mari basalts, the very high potassium basalts, and this chart here is the Polonarua stones. And the bottom one is the stanum eucrite from, uh, from asteroid Vesta. Triple oxygen isotope data shows a del 17 uh, O of minus 0.335, uh, which is far away from the terrestrial fractionation line. Here are the polar stones here. Here's the fractionation lines. And they group down here in the general area of the CV chondrites. Diatoms are identified by their, their shell morphology. And here are beautiful diatoms embedded in the polar stone. There can be no doubt that these are diatoms. They are clearly embedded in the You can see uh, ring of, uh, ring of portulae and aureoli and a ring of list. Uh, these are in uh, forms that are from Earth. A diatom type form, which is not readily recognizable as anything known. Uh, possible uh, acrotarchs. Strange organisms like hystricospheres. Possible diflugia or cinerids. Uh, these, I think, are similar to Globigerina foraminifera. Uh, similar in some respects to Lepocinclus spirogyra, a euglenid, but I have no idea if that's really what it is. But there's a great deal of unusual and exciting uh, uh, micropaleontology to be studied in these stones, and I'm very hopeful that uh, it will be possible to get others interested to help identify the great variety of microorganisms that are beautifully preserved in the polymeru stones. Well, in conclusion, the carbonaceous meteorites uh, contain only a subset of the amino acids and nucleobases. Uh, they are not contaminated. These fossils in the carbonaceous meteorites provide definitive evidence of extraterrestrial life. Neutron activation analysis is now being used to get precise determination of rare earth elements and trace elements, uh, and we're working to get 
a number of gas studies and measure radionuclides to get cosmic ray exposure ages. And I want to thank you for your attention. I want to mention that I've had great assistance from a wide number of people that are shown here. Thank you very much.